Hello, can everyone hear me? Okay, yep, cool. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, um, I'm Paul, talking about benchmarking and optimization of Rust libraries. And uh, just as a little bit of intro about who I am, so i um, currently principal engineer at um, Human Interest. Human Interest is a 401k processing company in, in San Francisco. You might be able to tell I'm not from there, um, so I've got, I've got an accent. And um, I've been working on Rust for, for a number of years, and as a result, um, had to create a number of libraries. Uh, one such uh, library that I'll be talking about in a lot of these examples is the Rust Decimal Library, which is a, a fixed precision decimal number library written in Rust. Um, so I've been told I, my accent's hard to understand, so I thought I would start off by giving a little bit of a 101 on the New Zealand accent. So um, but essentially, if you take the vowels, you take out the O, and then you move the sounds of the vowels over one, that's <laughs> the New Zealand accent. So if I say the word pan, you might hear this. If I say pen, you may be hearing that. And uh, likewise, if I say pin, sometimes you might be hearing that. So if you're hearing the word in yellow, then you're going to be good. Um, but if you're hearing the word on the right, you may need to re reverse engineer what I'm saying some of the times. Um, so, so on to the talk. Um, so the Rust ecosystem is growing. Um, when I first put together these slides, it was just under 17,000. Uh, this morning, it was around 17,700. Uh, it's very soon, it's going to be 18,000 18, crates. Um, and so with all those crates, we, we, we're starting to use them in our, in our projects. And we're implicitly relying on them and their downstream dependencies to really do their job correctly, um, securely, as well as quickly. Um, so as a, as a case point, really, is if you're using a decimal number library, you don't want that to be the, the performance bottleneck of your system. Um, and you also don't want it to be the source of bugs as well. Um, so, so to really um, be able to understand the performance of a system, the first thing we really need to do is be able to, to measure it. And really that the idea of this is so that you can understand whether you're um, making positive or negative impacts to your, to your library. And so just to, uh, to really intro into this is that there's a couple of terminologies that you've probably heard around there, micro and macro benchmarking. So micro benchmarking is where you're measuring a very small unit of performance, and macro benchmarking is where you're trying to simulate customer application workloads. Um, so when, when we're looking at some of these libraries, we may need to be considering both. Um, and we'll, we'll go into some of, those, uh, some of that detail throughout this talk. Um, so, so just to begin with, in order to benchmark, we need to know some of the tools that are out there. So um, Cargo Bench is the most obvious one to start, up, start off with. And the reason why is because it's included with Cargo. Um, it leverages the test crate. Um, test crate's internals are unstable at the moment, which means that uh, it can only be run on nightly only. But getting it up and running is relatively straightforward. So essentially, we need to include the, the test feature. And from there, um, it exposes the bench attribute. The bench attribute um, indicates what function should be uh, called under um, when the benchmark runs. And within each of those functions, um, you'll see that there's an iter, iter function. So everything inside there is what's being benchmarked. And in this first example, you'll see that the, the sub functions being uh, benchmarked in this, this particular example here. Um, and the results being passed through to the black box um, function just immediately afterwards. And the reason that's happening is because um, we need to make sure that the compiler is not doing any sort of optimizations. That means that we're not actually testing what we think we're testing within that iter function. Um, so running these results is um, pretty straightforward. It's a tabular format there. Um, we've got the names of the tests on the left. Um, we've got the number of nanoseconds per iteration on the right. And um, on the far right there, you'll also see the variance between the top and the bottom tests. Um, so over time, you'll probably want to be able to compare these to make sure you're either doing things, um, if things are improving or regressing. And so there's various ways of doing this. Um, you could be using spreadsheets. You could be using uh, all sorts of archiving strategies. But one tool that makes things a little bit easier is Cargo Bench Comp. 
And that's a cargo plugin, which essentially if you pipe your um, bench results out to file, you can pass those files through to BenchComp and it will spit out a, a tabular form like so. So the first thing you probably notice in this, in this particular table is the red and the green. Uh, the red indicates that something bad happened, uh, a regression, and the green indicates that something uh, good happened. So either this, this, the same performance or an improvement in performance. Um, so Cargo's pretty, it's, uh, sorry, Cargo Bench is included with Cargo, so it's pretty low effort to get set up. It's very fast to compile and execute, and uh, you don't need any external crates uh, within your Cargo TOML file. Um, and, you know, with a good archiving strategy, you could also compare results over uh, from version 3 to version 1 if you wish to. Um, the, the major downside, though, is that it's nightly only, and perform the reason for that is that um, performance may be different and stable. You may be testing against uh, experimental compiler features or whatever else, um, which means your results may be a little bit different. Um, Cargo Bench Comp can be a little bit sensitive to thresholds. So um, in, that in the previous example, there was green and red. I was actually running that against the same code without making any changes. Um, so essentially, um, you can control the threshold, but you've just got to be making sure you're comparing like for like tests. So some of those tests were taking two nanoseconds. If it goes to three nanoseconds, that's a 50% uh, increase. Um, the, the other thing with cargo bench is looping through sets of values can be a little bit tedious. And so um, with a decimal number library, you want to be able to test a range of values. Seven divided by three is not the same as six divided by three. Um, a very different calculation that, that actually happens under the scenes. And you can do this with Cargo Bench. It's just a matter of um, leveraging uh, macros to be able to do all the, the boilerplate code for you. Uh, a second library which is out there which um, is, is also viable to use is Criterion RS, and that's inspired by Haskell's Criterion library. Um, it's been written so that it runs on stable by default, which means it also runs on beta and nightly. Um, and getting that up and running is, is, um, is pretty straightforward as well. It's a matter of including the criterion crate uh, and then overriding the bench commands so that instead of invoking the default bench um, harness, it invokes the criterion uh, bench harness. And um, so within the code, relatively straightforward, we've got the criterion main function, which uh, essentially is what is getting invoked by the harness, uh, is the criterion harness. And instead of having the bench attribute, we have criterion group. So we had the bench attribute on each of the functions. Instead, you list them in that criterion group macro. Um, the, actual ma the actual function that gets called is relatively similar. It looks similar in the fact it's got an iter function, as well as um, passing the result to a black box. Um, however, the big difference there is it's wrapped around with a bench function um, function. And so what that is there for is to name all the benches. So because you're not able to leverage the attribute, the bench attribute, you've got to be able to name them via a string for it to work on stable. One, one of the actual side effects of this as well is they do have bench function over inputs, so you can actually pass multiple inputs to a, a benchmarking function also. Uh, the, the results are verbose, um, so as you can see, it's not a tabular format anymore. But within each of those um, benchmarks, it does give you a lot more information. It's giving you the, um, the time, the percentage change, uh, outliers, statistical significance, um, whether it regressed or not, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot more information there. And um, in addition, it spits out these uh, graphs. And um, I, I actually haven't used these graphs much in practice. However, I can imagine this would be a great thing to show your boss, show that you're actually uh, making an improvement there. Um, so Criterion is relatively easy to set up, and what I mean by that, it's an easy migration from Cargo Bench. The code was fairly similar, um, and you know it has some way-offs, um, which turn out to be kind of nice in some ways. So bench function over inputs means you can pass multiple inputs to a, a single benchmarking function, um, and it does provide statistics out of the box, which means you don't need a, a second uh, plugin or whatever to, to manage that. The major downside is it's that it's quite a bit slower than Bench. Um, it takes quite a while to, to uh, I guess, warm up the tests and then run them. 
And I, I guess it really depends on what your use case is, but if you're wanting to run things quickly or do minor small changes, then this can be a, a, a little bit of a bottleneck for you. Um, it does suffer similar um, threshold issues between iterations. Um, there is a, a chat going on about that in um, one of the, the forums about introducing the ability to control threshold. Um, but the, the previous example again showed regressions and uh, nothing had changed in the code. Um, and the, the, the last thing, which is more of just like a gotcha, is because you're naming your own benchmarking functions, you've just got to be careful to not name them the same thing. If you do, then you get these weird, subtle comparison errors and uh, that can just really throw you off if you haven't realized what you've done. Um, so, so before jumping into some of the practical things of performance, um, the other thing I just want to mention is just really understanding your application before um, running it under bench. So um, you can use instrumentation to help understand this. And the reason you might want to do this is to really understand what the internals of the application are doing um, before you, uh, I was, you understand what the internals are doing so that you can really uh, make sure that what you're um, testing against is what's expected um, from a normal application run. And um, the, there's various tools to be able to do this, but the whole idea here is that you um, understand what a both expensive calls, but also high in vacation calls. So um, in an example for a, the a decimal library for division, for bigger numbers, you might be calling um, a subtraction function maybe a thousand times internally, which isn't exposed via the public API. And so it's important that that particular function is tested under those sorts of loads. So um, we'll go into some of the practical things, and this one's going to seem a little bit of a cop-out because it's uh, going back to the fundamentals, but essentially some of the biggest wins you can get is really from re-looking at your approach. Um, there's things such as early exit conditions, there's operational efficiencies, um, using bitwise shift instead of dividing by power of two, um, there's uh, parallel operations, you've got dynamic programming, use of efficient types, We'll jump into use of efficient types a little bit more in this talk and uh, just go into that a little bit more. But just as a bit of an example, we'll just talk about um, Postgres write performance. Um, and so Postgres has a numeric data type, um, which you're probably all aware of. And to write out to the Postgres protocol, you need to essentially break a number into groups of 10,000 and then write out the number of groups that you've broken into, followed by the weight of the integer portion sign scale, and then followed by the groups of 10,000. So if we were to um, write out the number 3.14, then essentially we need to break it into groups. Um, so we group, break it into the integer portion and the decimal portion. And the integer portion we actually pad to the left with zeros to make it into a, a 10,000 um, group. And on the decimal portion we pad to the right to make it into a, a 10,000 uh, group. And so when we're writing it out, we write out two groups in this case. Um, the first one's an uh, integer portion, so the weight's zero. Um, and the scale in this case is two because there's only two decimal points that are relevant in the, the 1400 group. Um, so, so that was, you know, relatively easy, easy to explain from a base 10 perspective. Um, you know, if we had it in a string, for example, it might be quite easy to, to reason about how we might be able to implement this. We essentially chunk it into groups of four and uh, pad the zeros and output the results. So if, if we were to do that in Rust, we might do something like so, where we, we convert it to a string, we find out where to split the number um, so that we've got an integer portion and a fractional portion. Um, we can then go through and chunk it by fours, um, padding to the, to the left for the integer portion and padding to the right for the decimal portion. And then writing it out um, to the protocol um, with the, the big Indian um, format down the bottom. And so if we were to do it this way, then say we had uh, 15 samples that we're testing with, it roughly takes around 15,000 nanoseconds per iteration. So around about 1,000 seconds, uh, 1,000 nanoseconds per iteration for this particular example. And of course, I wouldn't be talking about this if you couldn't do it better. <laughs> so. Um, what if you didn't have to convert it to string? Well, you don't. Um, if you take a step back and think about the pure math approach about how to do this, then you may um, think about how to scale up the number to the closest 10,000 group, um, 
keep dividing it by 10,000 while storing the remainder and keep going until you reach zero and you've got your uh, groups. So if we took the, the 3.14 example again, um, we scale it up to a 10,000 boundary, which is 31,400. We divide it by 10,000, we get three with a remainder of 1,400. And we divide three by 10,000 with a remainder of three. We've got our groups on the right there, and that's without having to convert it to string first. So implementing this in Rust, um, we could do the following, where we essentially figure out what we should be scaling it up to, so the closest 10,000 boundary. Um, I'm also using a couple of other operational efficiencies here, which is um, instead of using the modulus and divider functions or the remainder of um, divider functions, instead just taking the last two bits of the number um, and likewise also bitwise shifting um, over to instead of dividing it by four. Um, so we've scaled up the number. We then divide the, the number by 10,000, storing the group into array, and finally we write it out to... Um, to Postgres. So the performance of that is quite a bit faster. It's 5,000 nanoseconds versus 15,000 nanoseconds. And so we're getting a, a, you know, a three times increase just from really looking at our approach. The first one was easy to reason about, but the second one, if you take a, a math approach to it, then you can um, uh, get some clear, clear wins just from uh, doing that. So the, the next one I want to talk about is fixed size slices performing better. So um, if we have two identical functions like so, where one of them takes a fixed size slice of three and the second one doesn't, then the hypothesis is the first one runs faster. And you're probably looking at this and thinking, well, obviously it runs faster, Paul. The, the second one does all these bounds checks, which the first one doesn't do. And uh, you'd be right in this particular case. So um, the, the first one, well, that one of them takes two nanoseconds per um, iteration, where the, the one with bounds checks takes three nanoseconds. And uh, within a loop, we get 2,100 nanoseconds and 3,700 nanoseconds. So it starts to, to broaden a little bit there. But what if we didn't have those bounds checks? What if we had this particular code here, which is, of course, a little bit dangerous to have in your production um, base, but nonetheless, how does that perform compared to a fixed size slice? Well, um, in a single iteration sense, it's close. It's two nanoseconds per iteration. But as we get into a loop, we start to see a little bit of a, um, a little bit of difference there. So we have 2,100 nanoseconds again versus 2,700 nanoseconds. So what, what this is saying to us is that by giving the fixed size slice, the compiler is able to make um, various assumptions or various, um, uh, I guess, heuristics to be able to understand that they can, uh, it can make further optimizations that it's unable to do without having that fixed size slice. So um, fixed size slices are indeed faster. Um, so following on from that, inlining can uh, both improve and hinder. And so with that previous example there, say we just throw inline always onto the top, what's going to happen? Well, um, if you said that things are going to improve substantially, then you'll be right. Um, but interesting to note is that both of them behave exactly the same way now. So with inlining, both of them take 1,300 nanoseconds per iteration for the multiple iterations and uh, one nanosecond for this, the singular version. Um, so what that's really telling us is that the compiler is able to make various, um, I guess, conclusions by having the, the code in line. So it's able to optimize the, the compiled code so that it, it, you know, everything runs faster. And uh, inlining for the second example of the bounds checks, well, it knows that the size of the uh, array that I'm passing through is three, so it can basically remove all those bounds checks and make things faster as well. Um, so, so with inlining, the, the common thing is, is um, well, uh, that I often hear is, are you smarter than the compiler um, to know when to inline? Uh, and essentially, I, I think if you're measuring things and you understand the impact of what you're doing, then sometimes I say, yes, you can be smarter than the, the, the compiler. Um, and so with a library, though, I, I think the main thing to call out there is that uh, just to be wary about the the impact you're going to be having on your downstream components, so all the consuming um, applications. So it will increase the binary size, and sometimes you won't get the benefits you want 
uh, with, uh, with the increased binary size. So um, my general rule is to be very wary of inlining uh, public API functions, but uh, go nuts with your internal stuff if you, if you know what, um, what the impact is. Um, so the, the fourth one is primitive types are almost always better. And so the first one's a little bit of a contrived example, but bear with me. Um, so if I was representing a decimal number, I might represent it as 10, div 10 divided by 10 to the power of E. And so if I wanted to represent pi um, to more precision, then essentially I have a bigger integer portion and a bigger scale to uh, help represent that. Um, and an obvious way of representing um, this particular number is with a big int. I mean, that's just a single number. It could store the m portion and a scale. Uh, we could store it as a, an array of uh, four u32s. Um, so have a 96-bit integer, so we have a cap there, and uh, a fourth one to represent a scale and a sign. Or, you know, since Rust 126, we could also use a 128-bit integer, so that's pretty cool. Um, so we'll take a look at big int versus u32, um, the, the, four, the, the array of four um, u32s. And as an operational example, we'll try to add together two decimal numbers. So adding, to do, adding together two decimal numbers is relatively straightforward. Uh, essentially, you need to have the numbers at the same scale to be able to add them together. So if I have 2.5, which is scale 1, um, plus 3, scale 0, then I just need to scale up the, the 3 to um, scale 1 to be able to add them together. So 25 plus 30, that's easy. You have 55 scale 1, so 5.5. Um, and so big int's a lot easier to reason about this. It's one single number you need to scale up. Um, and uh, if you have an array of, uh, you know, three U32s, then you need to start thinking about words and uh, how the overflow happens between binaries. It's not just a simple addition anymore. You need to essentially uh, add the bits together one by one. And so with a naive implementation of both of these, you can see that the, the uh, array version does actually um, behave a lot faster than the, the big int version. However, that's not really what I want to go into on this particular um, part. I really want to talk about exploiting fixed size primitives. So by knowing that that um, array is 96 bits, we can make a lot of assumptions about how we uh, add together or do certain things with that particular number. And so shifting on from addition, going to division, um, a naive implementation of division might look like so, and I'm using 32-bit numbers here, but essentially the concept's the same. So this is a, uh, the two's complement version of division, if you're not aware of it, is, um, is essentially uh, you take the dividend and you keep minusing the divisor. Every time you're successful, you increase the quotient. So um, as you can imagine, that doesn't perform very well. Um, <laughs> So for a smaller numbers, you can get really uh, good results, 80 nanoseconds, but as you get bigger than 90 million nanoseconds in iteration, it's, uh, it's not acceptable, in most cases, probably. Um, so we, we know that the, the, the size of the type is 32 bits. So with that, we can also make various assumptions about how that two's complement um, division works. So instead of looping through n number of times, depending on the size of the number, we can limit our loop through only 32 times and, ascent, and basically exploit the fact that it's a binary number. So we can exploit the fact that when things carry over, we can, um, they disappear from the number um, when we should bit shift left, and um, we can carry them over with uh, various tests that we need to. I, I won't go into this uh, math here, but um, essentially the idea of it here is that we um, are now only looping 32 times, so we get uh, around about 45 or 42 to 46 nanoseconds per iteration um, for this division, um, for all, all of those particular numbers. And I, I do want to call out here is that the 100 is actually slower in this case, so we do have 46 nanoseconds per iteration over the 18 we had before. But it's a reasonable trade-off considering that we now have a very consistent uh, performance across the board. 
Um, so uh, the, the other thing I just want to um, call out here is this is another example why you should be testing across a range of inputs. If I just have one test around for 100 or even uh, 200 or what 1,000, then it's not going to be uh, incredibly bad performance. But as I start to get to the bigger numbers, it starts to get hor horrible. Um, so the fifth thing I wanted to talk about is copy borrow semantics. And this one's... Um, and essentially, when we first start getting into Rust, well, uh, I'm sure a lot of us have battled with the borrow checker before, and we've done things like this to get around it. And obviously, that's a, a warning sign, because uh, cloning to get around the borrow checker isn't the, the way forward. It's just uh, the way forward temporarily or whatever else. Um, but essentially, if you're avoiding the borrow checker, it's probably a bad sign. And the reason being is copying or cloning a large struct, we all know that that can be expensive, but it, essentially it can also be expensive if it doesn't fit on the stack. So we need to be considering the size of the data that we're really uh, copying in these particular cases. So as an example, we'll take a look at the um, one we had before, which is the fixed size slice. Um, so we've got the fixed size slice of three there, and then on the bottom one there, the copy, we don't have the, the borrow. We copy the array instead of uh, borrowing it. And so if we were to look at the performance of this, then we can see that for a single iteration, it looks fine, two nanoseconds each, but once we get into bigger loops, then we start to see a little bit of a variance. And to be honest, this, this particular benchmark is an interesting one because it varies substantially between runs. Um, it really depends on how the, the process is working at the time, but essentially this one has a roughly around 2400 nanoseconds versus 2900 nanoseconds. So copying in this size, just 96 bits, is uh, absolutely slower than just uh, borrowing those 96 bits in this particular case. Again, if it can fit on the stack, it's fast, but if it doesn't, then it, it um, potentially could be a bit slower. Um, so. What about unsafe? I mean, unsafe is a great way to improve performance, right? So um, as library authors, I, I think that, well, the, the definition of unsafe really for within Rust, uh, from my understanding, is you're basically telling the compiler, hey, I know better than you. Uh, I know what I'm doing. Trust me. Um, and while that's fine when I'm writing the code, you know, I trust myself. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, uh, of course, I cause a lot of bugs as well. Um, but essentially, the, the community doesn't necessarily trust me like I trust myself. So having unsafe within your code is something that if you can avoid it, if possible, then that, you, know, you should be avoiding it. Um, and I, I have done a little bit of experimentation within the library, and I have found that um, in the cases that I've been looking at where I've thought, hey, if I just had mem move, that would be a lot faster. Um, I've actually found that there hasn't been any noticeable difference. Um, and I, I th think that's kind of interesting. I think that's something that, um, as, uh, as you know, within everyone here, if you're measuring your performance and you see that there's a huge performance increase, then you can make that trade off only if it's absolutely necessary. And so I, I think there, originally, I was jumping to the conclusion that unsafe was always going to be better. Um, and in terms of performance, it wasn't necessarily the case. And so I'd probably, um, uh, it would be interesting to challenge, um, challenge yourself by just uh, measuring your results. So just as uh, um, some closing thoughts is that, um, you know, as library authors, we have an implicit responsibility to consider um, performance. Uh, small details do matter. and. Um, it's really important that you understand how your application's working under load or under normal circumstances in order to really benchmark it effectively. Um, it's important that you're testing across a range of inputs. It would be a shame if you just were testing against dividing by 100 before and uh, the billion was um, turning into 90 million nanoseconds. So it's important that you're really considering a whole uh, variety of, um, of benchmark tests. And um, the, the main purpose of measuring is really so that you have insights so you can make effective decisions going forward. So, I, you know, all of this has really been a result of experimentation, so really understanding what's there, knowing that you want to make the improvement, and then absolutely uh, testing something and 
uh, I guess, testing a hypothesis and seeing if it actually worked. Um, so all in all, this community is awesome. Um, you guys are great for coming out to, to the Rust Conf, and we can keep making it awesome by really working together. And so um, uh, th thank you for listening. Um, if you do have any questions, then you can come and see me in the break. But I did also want to just say a special thanks to all those people that helped me uh, build these libraries. Uh, you guys are awesome, so thank you. <laughs>